Hi folks, welcome to our final part of this math scientist series. Even though it is recommended for you to check the previous two videos out, you do not need to watch them to understand this one, because here's some recap. From our previous two chapters, we have seen that math scientists were influenced by idealistic alchemists who tried to understand and utilize the knowledge of nature. And math scientists are generally wicked and terrifying because most of our very first and classic of this trope derive from the Gothic genre and the Victorian era. Now, as promised, in this video, I'm going to drive you through the history and investigate how Charles Darwin's theory has influenced our math scientists, and also how math scientists were developed from that time up until today. As many of you know, the most renowned theory Darwin had ever proposed was the theory of evolution. Even though he was not the first to suggest that living things change their form through time, he was still the pioneer in describing the details of how mechanism of evolution works. Since the idea that humans share ancestors with other animals was not aligned with Christian belief, which most of the Victorian hold on to, Darwin's theory was quite shocking and was very influential. Apart from the belief that God created humans as humans, not animals, there was the religious concept of the great chain of being, developed from Plato and Aristotle's thoughts. This concept describes the hierarchy of everything that existed in Christian belief. God is at the top, then angel, then humans. Animal, plants, and inanimate objects are below humans accordingly. Now science wants to declare that humans evolve from a lower hierarchy like animals. That's pagan, that's unacceptable. On the other hand, since Darwin's theories had debunked the concept of the great chain of being, more people began to wonder where the boundary between humans and animals should be. In this case, logical traits can be related to this doubt greatly. This is because in the novel, Dodgical's evil outer ego, Mr. Hyde, was perceived as primitive like an animal, both physically and mentally, due to his gruesome appearance and his fiendish, indecorous manners. It makes us wonder, since there was or might still be an animal within all of us, what separates human from the rest of the living things? Is it only our forms? Is it our etiquette, morals, manner, or is it something else? Besides, similar to the alchemist trope, science could be perceived as trying to play God. It was like scientists were trying to intrude the boundary of forbidden knowledge of nature and God's creation. A person trying to reach for this knowledge could be interpreted as an analogy of Adam and Eve and how they were punished for reaching the fruit of knowledge. There is another story that is very relevant to this trying to play God theme. Fun fact, the subtitle of the Frankenstein novel is The Modern Prometheus. Prometheus is known in Greek mythology as the one who stole fire from the Olympian gods and gave it to humans, making them capable of gaining wisdom and being more civilized. However, as a punishment, his regeneratable liver was eaten by an eagle every single day. These two characters, Prometheus and Frankenstein, share some characteristics in common as they were aiming for something to gain knowledge, but were perceived as overreaching and were getting punished consequently. Another aspect of science that is quite opposing to Christianity or most of belief system is that science, as science, not scientists, does not concern much with spirituality and morality. Science in and of itself does not say what are the right things you should do and what are the bad things you shouldn't do. Therefore, some people may be paranoid whether scientists possess a higher potential to abandon their ethical practices or not. Or even though some might trust that scientists are good more often than not, humans fear what they do not understand. Ordinary people do not usually get to see what is behind the black curtain of science. As a consequence, people could be afraid if something would go wrong in the lab, resulting in devastation, or if scientists would release knowledge that should better be kept unknown. On the other hand, they could be afraid if scientists are just obsessed and do not know what they are getting into. Or even if they know, they might lack that common sense to realize that they should not proceed with their hazardous research. And this is probably where that insane and obsessed archetype originated. All in all, with the skepticism over either science or scientists or occasionally both, speculation emerged and those imagination or predictions are reflected through literature. 
To give you an example, The Island of Dr. Moro was written in 1896 as speculation of what if a scientist conducts vivisection, dissecting animals alive, just for achieving another scientific discovery, not for providing greater knowledge that would benefit anyone. In the story, Dr. Moro created his beast folks by performing vivisection and was killed by one of his own creations afterwards. This was linked to the debate in the 19th century when our first modern animal welfare legislation was assented in 1822, followed by Cruelty to Animal Act in 1876. Furthermore, Darwin suggested the following about vivisection in his book Descendant of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex in 1871, after he noticed that animals are capable of feeling as they are similar to humans. The love of a dog for his master is notorious. In the agony of death, he has been known to caress his master, and everyone has heard of the dog suffering under vivisection, who licked the hand of the operator. This man, unless he had a heart of stone, must have felt remorse to the last hour of his life. From this text, Darwin agreed that an operation on living animals is considered distasteful. Based on this point of view, Dr. Morrow's experiment on animals is an example of what if scientists use science for their own purposes and not for society in general. By the end, he was punished due to his own actions. Similarly, take Mercy and Moira, who are scientists in biology, as a simple comparison between a scientist and a mad scientist. There is a reason why many people consider Moira as a mad scientist, though she seems sane enough to completely understand whatever in the nine hills she is doing, which is quite different from our stereotypical mad scientist. The reason is that she is dedicated to bioengineering and uses her knowledge for the sake of advancing scientific research. However, she does not show any concern over any circumstances resulting from her experiments. Ah, poor Gabriel. On the contrary, Mercy's moral and ethical code is quite strong. Plus, I find their in-game interaction quite interesting. Describing your work as unethical would be a kindness. But the true question is whether or not you can deny my discoveries. No, I didn't think so. I know we have our differences, but your brilliant mind would be welcome amongst my colleagues in Oasis. No, thank you. You and your colleagues discredit the field of science. I want nothing to do with it. See, Moira simply does not care if her research is ethical or not as long as it is true and serves her interest. My scientists can also be a reflection of the doubts over new scientific fields and how they are utilised. In classic works like Dr. Frankenstein, Dr. Jekyll and Dr. Morrow, these mass scientists prefer to work alone in secret lab or with as few people as possible, because in the past science was mysterious and incomprehensible by the many. However, as scientific research was more well accepted and was applied in businesses, in modern films, the number of mass scientists who work in organization increased. For example, Dr. Strangelove was a former Nazi scientist in his story, Dr. Strangelove or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb. Meanwhile, a scientific topic that would fit the concern of modern days should be about technologies like robots or AI. The AI and robots features in movies often try to conquer the world or have already done so. The movies related to this issue are iRobot, Terminator, and Wall-E. I mean, I count this as a dystopian for humanity, okay? Or even in games like Detroit. Out of this list, iRobot and Terminator are the movies that include scientists as one of their prominent characters, and their fates are quite similar to our typical mass scientists. Dr. Alfred Lanning in iRobot was the founder of the US Robotics. On the other hand, Miles Bennett Dyson was one of the developers of the AI Skynet in Terminator. Both of their works didn't end well, I mean, one was killed by his own creation, and for another one, his scientific achievement analysed that humans should be demolished, and as a result, his AI became a threat to humanity. It was not like these scientists intended this to happen, by the way. Here we go again, another trope of, I didn't expect this to turn out terrible, but it does. 
another sign of people being anxious over the unknown part of science. So from Darwin's theory of evolution to the debate on vivisection, the Cold War, to the concern over technologies, mass scientists are repeatedly used as a figure representing the potential negative side of science. Let's wrap up for real. So back to my initial question, since when have scientists gone mad? From the start, we can see that mass scientists got their trying to play god trope from alchemists. They were portrayed as evil or someone who has done something evil in gothic literature. Lastly, people during the Victorian or even until nowadays are dubious over science or scientists, especially for a new field or a new invention, making our imaginist tropes still last in our modern media. Even though there are more good-hearted scientists who are not mad being portrayed due to the rising number of people who understand science. Actually, when we look through this, many mad scientists have never really been mad, psychologically. Even Dr. Frankenstein, the most iconic mad scientist of all time, was not mad per se. On the contrary, it is the scientists' works that people focus on. It is their experiments that are perceived as profane. In my opinion, a mass scientist character can never be boring. Modern mass scientists may either work alone in secret or work in an organization, or even be a mixture of both. Like how Sita Clown worked in secret, but he also worked under the Flamingo's Don Quixote family. Another thing that makes mass scientists more interesting is that they can be evil or even be good. Also, you can just take any scientific subject, twist it a bit, and apply its darker side to a mass scientist. Plus, we have plenty of scientific ideas and inventions nowadays, and those can always be sources for the scientist characters, especially for the mad one. All things considered, I hope to see new sites of mad scientists. It's quite interesting to explore what aspect of scientists they will soon reveal. Although my next topic is not exactly in this area, I still have a long topic list on mad scientists I want to research on. So if you are interested, you can click subscribe to support me in producing more of this. And if I have missed anything, you can comment that down, or you can just write down your favorite mass scientist and why. It would be super interesting to talk with you on this topic, whether it is a serious talk or just a shit chat. I hope to see you sooner or later, whether the next video will be about mass scientists or not. Take care and see you on our next journey.